Hi, everybody. I'm trying to get my camera going here. Here it goes. How's everybody doing tonight? So welcome to the virtual night sky, our version of the night sky uh, for uh, February the 9th. I was explaining this show to somebody uh, earlier today, and maybe we should have said the virtual day sky. Today, we're actually going to be talking about the sun and how to how we observe the sun, what we can observe, how the sun kind of changes its position in the sky over the seasons, and how we can track the sun and sort of follow and understand how it relates to the seasons. And so that's really what the program is about tonight. If you remember, we've been starting uh, this particular year with fundamentals. And so uh, four weeks ago, uh, we, uh, we talked about the stars themselves, where the stars are, how we view them. Uh, two weeks ago, we uh, delved into the moon and uh, all things lunar. Today, we're going to do the sun. And then on uh, two weeks from now, we'll actually go to the planets. And this is really just to kind of get the fundamentals out of the way. And if you've watched, you probably know, we'd like to sort of just kind of do this two ways of seeing things, you know, what's going on in space, what's happening in the night in the sky, and then what we get to observe and how we get to engage the sky in, in various ways. So, so this will follow that. It's about the sun. Uh, I'm going to talk for about the first uh, 20 to 25 minutes about the sun and uh, sort of some of these views. And then I have a very special guest tonight, and I'll introduce her uh, at the half hour. Uh, but she's going to kind of help us understand uh, sun watching, and especially from a Native American perspective. So that'll be uh, that'll be something to look forward to. Uh, and then we have some of the regular things. We'll give you a little update, a little resource, so some things going on. And then I've also been uh, using these episodes to talk about the five things. It doesn't have a better name than that, but we talk about the five things that I believe we can do as people to sort of like to keep ourselves connected to the bigger natural world and a especially sort of uh, for the sky and, uh, and seasons and how that works. And so I'll be introducing the third of five things tonight. I'll get you up to date on that. That's how we'll close. So uh, joining us tonight and in the background and uh, always sort of supporting the program in very many ways, uh, we have Kim Baptista. She's your webmaster. You probably heard from her. And she'll be sending you something after the program, a wrap up. We send a survey out every week and I'll make this plug. I say, this is really is a time uh, to give some feedback Back. We do use your feedback to try to you know, help design shows and understand what you want to hear. So do that with us. Meg Alfred is my colleague and she and, uh, is with us tonight and uh, she kind of helps guide the show and keep things going and keep it on uh, on track. Uh, uh, Alicia Hyatt is with us tonight. She is a former student, but now she's an employee and she's an education specialist and uh, you'll see her tonight. Uh, student uh, uh, Alex Blanche um, has uh, been with us all along and a new student we met for the first time last week or two weeks ago, um, Armandala, and we hope he's a regular on the program as we go forward. Just a couple quick little uh, sort out things. I don't know how many of you are new, how many of you kind of watch this over time, uh, but we don't do chat. That's kind of not, you're not allowed. We don't do that, but we do encourage you to go into the uh, the question and answer and uh, use it to ask questions for sure. But also if you have a comment or you have something, uh, kind of keep it going there. So if, uh, if you want to make a comment about something you see, that's a good place to dump it. And we will be answering your questions along the way. And we will bring some of the audience questions kind of to the uh, uh, to the breaks as we go through tonight. So so that's how the, how the format works. Um, there is closed captioning. You might see it on your screen. You get to decide whether you want to see it or not. We we run it as a practice, and it helps us post this uh, program later. Uh, but um, if you want to turn it off, you're kind of in charge of that. And uh, I think that's all the sort of the housekeeping. I want to welcome. I think we made an extra effort to notify a bunch of educators. We're going to do a special program and include uh, some teachers uh, in in several weeks, in in a month from now. And so we've been been you know, kind of trying to include some of our friends that are especially in the K twelve schools, especially STEM educators uh, in uh, middle school. And so if you're here, and if some of your students are here, welcome. I'm sure really appreciate having you with us. All right, let me get started. If I, I hope I didn't miss anything on that on that particular thing. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen and uh, what you're going to see here is uh, a little bit of the night sky. I'm not going to actually spend too much time out here in space, but you can sort of see what's going on here. Uh, remember, tonight's program is about the sun. And so what I'm showing you is the Earth's orbit around the sun. 
remember, um, this is kind of funny because every time we talk about the sun, like uh, sunrise, like, uh, uh, you know, when you see the sun, uh, as the sun moves across the sky, we always talk about at it as the body that's moving around. But what we have to remember is that from our perspective, uh, we see the sun, but from the sun's perspective, uh, we're moving around it. And so uh, we get to see the sun um, in the daytime, and that means we don't see stars, but the sun is always positioned against a background of stars. We'll look at that tonight and see how it moves through space. Um, I also wanted to just kind of just talk some really quickly the fundamentals of this motion, because we're going to talk about the sun's motion and the properties of the Earth's orbit, right? And then we're going to talk about sort of how we actually can see the sun. And I'm going to introduce this idea there's an apparent sun, it's where we see it. There's a mean sun, which is an average of how it travels through the sky. And then there's uh, and then there's time. There's a solar noon and there's a civil noon, and they're not the same thing. In fact, in Phoenix, Arizona, we're off by about half an hour, and I'll explain why that works. So how does that? How could we be? How could our noon be 12:28 in the afternoon? Uh, we'll see. We'll see how that works. I'm going to add the poles of the Earth, and so just to sort of like re kind of uh, uh, do this, you've probably seen. Uh, 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 simulations before, but the, the Earth is actually tilted in its orbit to the sun. As you can see here, I've got a little toothpick sticking through the sun. And you can see that some of its or during some of its orbit, those poles kind of in the northern hemisphere lean out. For some of the orbit, those poles kind of lean in. And that's really what makes the seasons. Uh, during half of its orbit, uh, the sun is showing a little bit more intently on the northern hemisphere. During the other half of the orbit, the sun is uh, showing a little bit more intently, like in this view right here in the southern hemisphere. But it's that annual motion, it going around. The poles don't wobble. They just kind of stay pointed to the same part of the sky. Uh, but as the sun moves around, that is really the reason for the seasons and the meaning of all of that stuff. I've got just a little picture here to show you because we talked a lot about orbital elements uh, before. Uh, we did this when we were talking about the moon, and I just want to remind some people of some things that are going on here. The Earth doesn't orbit in a circular orbit around the sun, and no planets do, and no moons do. That's one of the things Kepler taught us about 400 years ago, that all orbits are elliptical. And then the center of gravity on all orbits is a little bit off. So the sun isn't in the middle of this whole thing. Uh, we actually get a little closer to the sun here. We call that point where we're closest to the sun perihelion. And that happens in the first part of the year. Uh, it is actually happens to happen a little bit after the December solstice, the winter solstice, uh, but that's accidental. There's no relationship between the solstice happens because it's the lean of the earth, the tilt of the earth, and the southern exposure. The perihelion happens because of our orbit. Perihelion also moves. It actually sort of moves over time. It's very slow. So generally, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, the perihelion has always been towards the first part of the year. And it's just when we're closest. Uh, and then the other side of that, aphelion in the middle of July, the sun is kind of further away. So this is a little counterintuitive. If you think the, the position of the sun, right, its closeness causes our summers and winters, that doesn't happen. The change in distance is really less than about 10%. The real reason for those seasons is the tilt of the earth. And we'll sort of like, like do that. There's another thing I want to show you. So remember this. Oh, one more thing about this is that the, the Earth actually moves faster around the sun when it's in perihelion. So the speed of the Earth actually increases our orbit, speed in the orbit increases over here, and then we slow down over here when we get further away. You can sort of, if I exaggerate that thing, you can sort of see a spinning by the sun and go way out and spinning by again. Of course, it's not that exaggerated. We call this eccentricity. Uh, the sort of ovalness of an orbit. and But remember, this is really important for our conversation tonight. Faster here and slower here as we go through this, okay? That's kind of cool. Um, another one I wanted to show you, I just have a chart, and I'm going to introduce you to this a little bit later. We're going to, I'm going to draw on and all this stuff. But for right now, I just want you to notice, and this is a star chart across the sky. This is the Earth's equator, shot out into space right here. So this is the equator of the Earth. And here you see uh, the apparent motion of the sun. 
I always have to say apparent, right? Because it's not moving. Uh, we're leaning or tilting away or tilting forward, but this is what it looks like. And so over an entire year, the sun moves across the constellations in the sky until winter solstice over here. And then it starts to get up. It crosses the equator at the equinox in springtime right here, first day of spring. And then up here is hot, hot summer in Arizona. So June 21st up here, and then back down again to an equinox. And so the cycle is here. So you got two things, two big things to remember when we're kind of talking about how we observe the sun. First, uh, that movement uh, in the sky, right? Lower and souther, and then upper and norther, and a nice clean little cycle like that. And then the speed up and the slow down part of this orbit. That's a good start. That's how we're going to start. Now I'm going to play this really silly game here. I'm going to try to land us right at, um, I'm going to turn off that. I'm going to make the Earth smaller again. Let's lose that silly toothpick going through the poles. I'm going to press this button, and this is going to be, oh, here, I'm going to do this, this. And we're going to land on the roof of my building in Tempe. Let's see if this works. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> and there's the campus. Now I'm going to move backwards a little bit in time because I really want to kind of just talk about uh, solar noon. So I'm going to get the sun up in the sky. Do, do, do. You know, in my first planetarium job, they said, never, never go backwards. Anyway, now I'm going backwards. And then, of course, at noon, we don't get to see the stars, right? So let me just turn the stars. Up. So here it is. There's your sun. And it's up in the sky. It's got to do a little kind of things in the background here. I'm going to turn off that. And I'm going to turn off that. <clears throat> I'm going to turn off that. And, um, and so what I'm looking from the roof of my building, I'm looking towards South Mountain, and certainly there's the sun. And if I had asked you before the show, so, 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 so when is noontime? And you could describe that a whole bunch of different ways. That noon is when the sun is highest in the sky. That might work. Uh, noon is at that period of time where uh, the sun crosses the meridian. Like, oh, almost got it. Look at this. <clears throat> and I'll just move it back. So this might be what you call noon. And I'll tell you, this is basically solar noon. That is correct. And when the sun actually sort of crosses that line, this is looking directly south. When it crosses that line, that's what we call noontime. Uh, but in Arizona, and I'll get a little bit more detail on this in a minute, noon, solar noon actually happens on average at 1228. So not 12 noon, right? That's called civil time, the time on your watch, right? The one we all follow. You guys all join the program at seven o'clock. That's civil time. The sun is actually doing its own thing, and we call that solar time. And so I'm just going to explain a little bit more about how that works. In order to get into this, I got to do a little trick here. I'm actually going to sort of like uh, raise our view a little bit. I have to actually sort of move uh, so that because I want to show you the full extent of the sun in our sky. And I'm going to get the horizon out of here because that doesn't sort of work anymore. I'm going to, so basically, I'm moving this down so you can still see the amount of degrees above uh, the horizon that the sun is. And I still have the meridian on the screen. And now I'm going to do this thing. I'm just going to sort of let me turn the meridian off. And I'm going to move basically a week per second through time. So just to sort of explain, the sun doesn't move this way on its daily motion. But if the computer is capturing the location of the sun every day at exactly the same time, and in this case, it's, I think I started right at 1228. So you see it goes really high, and then you see it slow down, turn around, and come back down. I'm going to give you a little sort of trail so you can sort of follow the movement here. So now it's headed down. We have passed June the 21st. The moon's now getting lower in the sky. The sun's getting lower in the sky. Now we're sort of about the equinox. At some point, it's going to bottom out in December, just at the lower part of this scene right there. There it slows down, almost comes to a stop, and then goes back up again. I don't know if you know this, but solstice, the term solstice means standstill. And so ancient, we're going to give you a horizon view in a minute. And ancient people saw that as the time when the sun moves across the horizon. And it tends to sort of look like it stops a little bit, just slows down a little bit. And then it'll sort of start turn around and start going the other way. So, so just again, right, you're not going to go out in the daytime and look at the sun doing this. 
but you will go out in the daytime and you should notice that the sun is higher in the sky in the summertime. This makes sense. Lower in the sky in the wintertime. And this is, this is how that works. Uh, another line. So let me see. I'll add the meridian back in so you can sort of see. Here's the, the, the sweep, right? The sun from Phoenix, Arizona gets up to about 80 degrees above the horizon. Not completely overhead, but way up in the sky in the summer. And then in the other. The other line I'm going to sort of uh, do for you here is what we call the line of the ecliptic. <clears throat> And this is basically, you can now see this one is calendarized. You can see that each one of these little dots, these little marks are one day of travel. If I just move forward today, you'll sort of get a sense of how that works. So the sun sort of moves and you see uh, the tilt of the line. And do you remember when I was showing you that chart, that really graceful little curve going up and down and then over and all this stuff? The line of the ecliptic can be sort of seen to describe that particular shape. What that is, is this is essentially the plane of the solar system. It's the equator of the sun shot out into space. We travel along that plane as we travel. But remember, our view of the sun changes as we're going around. And this is sort of how that works. If I just kind of move through space you know, for a little bit here, you'll see that the sun right, is moving along the ecliptic. The line of the, the ecliptic shape is changing. So it's taking the sun lower and lower and lower as we approach winter time. What are we going into October now? That was the equinox of this path. As you can imagine, what's going to happen is that in December, the sun's going to reach its little base there and then it starts to go up again. Okay. Does that all sound good? So, and then this shape, who knows? I just, I can't get an answer from you, but I don't, some of you might know what this shape is called. It has a funny name. We call that an analemma. Analemmas have been known. It's a favorite of, uh, let me show you another little image here. It, it's a favorite of uh, astrophotographers because what they can do, I'm just gonna show you this in the sky. If you were to take a camera, remember I said one specific time every day. If you were to take a camera out and set it up, I don't know how this guy set up a camera on the hillside. It has to be exactly in the same location every single day. And you have to say exactly the same time on your watch, civil time, right? When your watch says in this case, maybe it was about three in the afternoon, he'd take a picture. And then three days later, he'd be in exactly the same place and take another picture. And then he just stacks them and stacks them on top of each other. But you can see, if you do that over time, you created the shape. Look, there's an analemma or a bowling pin, if you want, in the sky. And so, so that's really sort of the, what you're looking at, each one of those dots represents the apparent location of the sun. That's where, the, where you see it. Um, let me get rid of that again. I'm going to go back to my thing. I'm going to unencumber us of some of these lines. Let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. I'm going to give you a clock to look at now, though, so you can start to see uh, how this motion happens. As I go forward a little bit, I wanted to sort of just get you up to something uh, maybe just about right. Yeah, let's come down a little bit. I'm going to let it go up, come down. So you see, this is that was the uh, uh, June the 21st. <clears throat> Let me add the meridian back again, just so we can see this. I'm going to stop it for a moment. So if I move backwards here just a little bit, I better turn the trails off. If I just move backwards in time and put my sun on the meridian, I want you to look at what time it is. See there. See how it says 1213? Um, so that means civil time, 12 noon, when you think the sun is the highest part of the sky, it's actually sort of over here a little bit. Right? And what that means is that because of those motions in the sky, we have this thing we call it the equation of time. So the distant difference between the mean solar time when it crosses the, um, the horizon every day, 24 hours later, the difference between that and where the sun actually is, is a little bit of a time gap. We call that the equation of time. I'll show you a little chart here. This is a little bit hard to look at sometimes. Um, remember I talked about eccentricity. This little chart shows you how far behind or how far ahead the sun goes because it speeds up and slows down. 
remember this part of the year where it's going faster and that means it's kind of catching up and it's actually going ahead of its mean solar time up to up to about seven or eight minutes in this particular case and then it sort of drops back down and then it gets behind by about seven minutes of this. this one is the obliquity that is actually the tilt of the earth and so what happens as the sun traces across the sky as it's going up it's going slower advancing against the stars when it gets to the top of its little crest, it goes a little faster against the star. And then when it goes down again, it goes a little slower. So those two little time sequences, if you stack them on top of each other, they become this. This becomes a calculation of the equation of time. You see the sun does this little funny thing. This chart translates into the analemma. So I can do this for you. Let's say 100 days into the year, right? On this particular chart, the sun is about seven minutes behind. A hundred days into the year, on this particular chart, the sun is about four days ahead. The difference between that seven behind and four ahead is going to be about three minutes behind, and that's sort of this here. So if you add all of those up and then rechart it in this particular shape, right, that's how we get our natural analemma. Does that make sense? Everybody got this? Now, do you actually see that? No. But I do want to sort of just say that it's interesting that we have a civil time where we just regulate time on a 24-hour basis, and that's how we use it, and that's how our watch works. But there are places um, where um, that doesn't necessarily work very well. I'm going to take that picture off. I'm going to show you a thing called time zones here. So when mean time crossing the meridian, remember my son is sort of like sitting right on the meridian, and when it is equal to civil noon, like by my watch, right, the sun and the noon is the same, happens at certain places on the earth. The main one is zero, right? This is uh, Greenwich uh, meridian. As you go forward, every 15 minutes of travel of the sun around the Earth, it crosses a specific time zone. So at all of these lines, right, mean time and noon time are the same thing. But what about Phoenix? Here's our problem. We are right in between this 105 degrees in Albuquerque and 120 degrees in Ventura, California. We actually are this thing. So when I show you that the sun crosses our meridian on average about 28 minutes after the hour, it's because we have that location. We're well, between two means if you want. So, okay, I've got to hurry a little bit to show you another really cool thing before we go. I'm going to kind of just uh, sort of put this now uh, in the context of a horizon. It'll take you just a second to get this set up here. I shall get rid of that meridian. I shall get rid of that clock. Time off. I am going to uh, move us uh, 90 degrees in this particular direction. <clears throat> And I'm going to add another panorama that you haven't sort of seen yet. And so, and then I will go to, actually, I'm just going to, this might be a little bit funny. You'll see a lot of flashing. But we'll, sort of, we'll get there. Um, and the last thing I need to do, I'm going to land us. There it goes. So this is actually a panorama, a real panorama from Chimney Rock, New Mexico. There's a national monument there. And you can see sort of the, maybe some of you have been there. Here's a little chimney spire sticking up over here. Uh, there is a plaza way up on top over on this side. And there's this moon thing that happens here. Someday I'll show it to you. It's a, it, it's a kind of one of those things that happens about every 18 years. And people think that's really important. I'll show it to you another day. But right now I'm on this little ledge right here, looking down into a valley. And this is known as a sun temple. This is known as a place where Native Americans go out and celebrate what they call the corn blessing in the morning, and they observe the sun. So here's where the sun rises during the summer solstice. If I just move ahead a little bit, I'm going to move forward a little bit in time. This is what we call a cross quarter in the 
number of days between summer solstice and equinox, if you mark that particular time, we use this cross quarter. And I'm going to be asking Mary when we bring her to the, to the program here, um, if, if cross quarters happen in her culture as well. Here's the equinox. That was be where the sun is sort of like rising from the horizon. Uh, equal day, right? Equal time. That's about halfway across. Here's another cross quarter halfway between there and the winter solstice. And here's where the sun would rise on the winter solstice. So here here I have a horizon. It's marked with sort of features. I can see all this thing. This, this bluish kind of mountain in the background is about 60 miles away. Um, it's, we're looking east towards the central valleys of New Mexico. These are a little bit closer. This is only about four or five miles from our observing site over on this side. But you can see clearly year after year after year, you could see the march of the sun across the sky. It will slow down when it gets to these equin or the solstices. It'll slow down and just tend to hang here for a little every morning rising from about the same place and then it'll turn around and then sort of move back up again marking 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 this mirrors exactly your seasons you can watch the sun on the horizon and you can actually know what's going to happen next you can predict when the rains are going to come you can predict uh, when certain things are going to happen, when certain things are going to ripen, when certain animals are going to migrate, you can understand your resources and your natural environment and watch this movement of the sun back and forth across the horizon. And you can predict, you can see. And we know cultures throughout history have had their sun watchers. And so call them priests, call them shamans, call them whatever you like, usually elders. And they're assigned through their knowledge that they've gained through the entire year, this particular important occupation. Get up in the morning, get out there, watch that sunrise, watch what happening, watch what's happening. And you can see how this can start to set cycles of celebrations or cycles of travel or cycles of, uh, of setting things up. And so, so this is really where I, um, I kind of wanted to leave uh, the, the program. And I'm going to kind of just stop break here for a little bit on uh, some questions and answers. And we'll have a little poll question here. And then in about three or four minutes, I'm going to bring Mary. I'll introduce Mary. We'll bring her on. And we'll talk about the sort of the significance of this idea and, uh, and see where that goes. So there's your son. I'm going to stop share here for a moment and we will get going. Isn't that funny? Just at the moment, I forgot how to stop share. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> so I hope that was uh, enlightening a little bit, um, observing the sun. And then the other sort of unintuitive thing about the sun is that it is always traveling against a background of stars. And uh, your horoscopes, the way we sort of think about sort of seasons, if you want to follow your horoscopes, uh, the time when the sun is moving through your zodiacal constellation is uh, essentially that time of year. But the weird part is that's not when you can see your constellation. It sort of shows up at another time. So, um, so that's kind of just good to remember that we're seeing it during the day. You can't see the stars, but there is always a background of stars back there. And there's always a reverse of that. The stars you get to see at night during certain seasons. All right. Uh, can I bring uh, some team to together uh, to the table? Alicia, Alex, you got some questions? Hello. Yes. I'm going to go ahead and launch our first Zoom poll of the evening. Sure. And that is, what is the sun composed of? Uh, hydrogen and helium, hydrogen and carbon, helium and oxygen, or hydrogen and xenon. So go ahead and catch your votes below. And while we're waiting for that, maybe Alex can come on and take a question or two. I like the xenon one just because I think it's a cool word. Xenon is a, yeah. is a great gas too. Uh, xenon, I think they use yeah. it in a lot of nice, pretty signs that you get to see on the street. But um, I hope people don't listen to me. <laughs> um, we had some great questions. Um, a lot of our were answered by our wonderful kind of behind the scenes staff. Um, we had questions a lot about accuracy of sundials. And you kind of touched on this, Rick, when you talked about the difference between mean sun and actual sun. And when we're talking about sundials, they're not always accurate. And it's because sundials measure time based off the position of the actual sun. But as you said, that's not always exactly how time's measured in general. So 
Uh, good question about that. Sometimes also when you buy a sundialer, you get one. Sometimes it'll come with a little chart. And and yeah. actually, you'll see these in public spaces, too. There's the sundial, and just sort of embedded in the pedestal, there might be a little chart that tells you. And uh, in the old days, we used to call that sunfast. And the term was, uh, you know, what's the difference? What do you have to add or subtract on this particular day to make the sundial accurate? And so yeah. I would argue that the sundial is accurate and our time is off. But that's all right. So that's another story. Yeah. So that, that was one of the um, one of the questions we had. We actually had some um, uh, people checking in and saying hi. And um, we actually had one of our uh, teacher, Tracy Dodrill, came in and oh, said good. hello. I, I think and we're going to see Tracy, Tracy is going to join our program in about a month. So that'll be good. Good to see her. Yeah, that'll be that'll be great. So, yeah, she, she was checking in. And then, um, yeah, it's a lot of great questions. Please send in any more that you have and we'll answer them live or answer them behind the scenes. And uh, I think we're back to Alicia for polls. How did everyone do? Thank you so much, Alex. Wonderful questions here. Um, and speaking of wonderful questions, our wonderful audience at 90% <laughs> got this answer right. So very exciting yeah. to know that the sun is composed of hydrogen and helium. Rick did not stump us. So um, with that being said, Rick, I'm gonna pass it off to you yeah. to, to take it from here. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay, it is actually my pleasure to bring to the screen um, Mary Oahaki. Uh, Mary, I really am acquainted with her because I'll just tell a little sort of thing here, but we're both part of another organization, and it's called the Society for Cultural Astronomy in the American Southwest, which is a huge, long name for just a group of people. And we just kind of like to study how uh, Southwestern cultures now and over time have just kind of brought astronomical ideas into their culture. And, and there's many, many examples of it. And of course, we kind of got on the clue bus about a decade or so ago and said, you know, we shouldn't be talking about this by ourselves. We should be talking about this with Native Americans. And, uh, you know, they, they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And she and Mary, every time I talk to her, has a fascinating background. So I, she has lots to, lots, to, lots to learn from Mary. Uh, Mary is part of, uh, lives in Santa Clara, Santa Clara Pueblo in New Mexico. And I'll just say a little bit, she is the, uh, she is an archeologist. Uh, she works for this, the uh, New Mexico Cultural Preservation Office. And is, I think she's engaged in digging daily, even right now. And uh, uh, she also is half Comanche. And um, I just sort of came to know her through uh, sort of uh, 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 some club activity that we do. And we kind of do journal readings and things like that. And we both sort of show up and we both ask questions. And we both do that. So, so Mary, welcome to the program. And thank you for being here. And thank you for bringing an amazing perspective to the table. So, so, so I'm glad to be here and, uh, and share my view on our relationship to the sun and, and what to um i believe we we all have the same uh idea about what the sun brings it brings life it brings healing it brings you know strength um there's a lot involved uh when you're talking about the sun uh rick mentioned that i was from santa clara pueblo uh, Armand, if you could put up the map. Yeah, we have a little map. To yeah, if you don't know where um, Santa Clara is, it's it's north of Santa Fe, about 33 miles north. And uh, let's see if Armand. There it is. Okay, so you'll see uh, Santa Clara is located right here. Yeah. And uh, all along that uh, Rio Grande um, River, which is the blue uh, line coming straight down. You see all the Pueblo villages in location, as well as the Ute, uh, Hickoria, Muscalero, Zuni, and um, the Denita uh, populations over to the north uh, west. So my little village is right there in Santa Clara. And uh, uh, I grew up there as a child and was taught a lot of uh, um, culture and learned a lot of religious factions from my grandfather and my grandmother and also being a participant of the village um, I my other uh, half is um, of course from Comanche land and the Comanche uh, pretty much went up and down the Rio Grande River uh, and 
same thing uh, involved sun uh, worshiping. And I don't really want to say worshiping. Well, I guess I could. But uh, earlier, uh, Rick talked about uh, the ceremony of um, giving cornmeal at the Chimney Rock site in New Mexico. Um, and that giving or offering of cornmeal in the morning is common practice. So we grind, uh, we grow white corn and then we grind it. And this grinding has to be done um, sometimes in, at sunrise. And the women uh, are the grinders of the corn. The men keep the rhythm of the beat of the grinding of the corn on a drum or sometimes singing so that um, we don't feel the pain. <laughs> You don't feel the burn while you're grinding this corn and this cornmeal becomes um, an offering every morning. So you wait, you get up um, in the morning and you look to the sunrise and you'll um, honestly wait there until you see the first rays come up and then the sun sort of peaks at the top of the horizon and that you can stand and face and, you know, breathe your breath on that cornmeal in your hand, your right hand, anything on the left is symbolic of death. So right hand is life. So you breathe your breath, your breath of life on there. And then you offer your cornmeal to the sun. And then you ask him or you ask the sun for, uh, like I said, healing, strength, prayers, not only Prayers are something that are not uh, a selfish thing. You pray for your whole village. You dance for your whole village. You never dance for yourself or just so that people can watch you. It is something that you do for all of us, the whole world, even at some point. Mary, so, I, was, I, was, I was actually able to, when I was taking those images of that horizon, I'm kind of spending some time up there. I did do a corn um, meal that's offering one morning. It was cold. I had to get up there. I wasn't staying there. So I had to get a, probably a couple hours early and, you know, get, get, a, you know, get up there and get to the thing. It was absolutely fascinating. It was exactly like you were, you were talking about. So, and then let me ask you just real quick about uh, the youth. So right now I have a whole bunch of students and I have trouble getting them to come to work at like eight or nine in the morning because they don't get up very early. But when you were younger, did you get up like at uh, before dawn or? Oh yeah, we were up before dawn. And like I said, uh, grandpa would say, uh, you have to get up before uh, and throw your cornmeal before uh, nine o'clock or he won't hear your prayers. Now, whether he was tricking us to get up that early, <laughs> or not that's other things that's, to do too. yeah he was always tricking us grandpa he was funny but it, that was he he should have been a shrink a psychologist and you know, a child psychologist he always had us working at five o'clock have your meal six o'clock throw in your cornmeal between six thirty and seven Mary, I mentioned in that thing, I just showed people that notion of cross quarters. And if I understand some one of the papers that we talked about just recently over the last month or so, uh, there's this, this idea that uh, lots of ceremonies start on cross quarter dates as opposed to others. Does it happen in your culture too? Is that is that it, very it, common? Or it that... does happen, yeah. So certain dances or certain uh, religious affairs happen during those cross quarters. Uh, ours, uh, of course, February, this is the month of February. So if COVID wasn't here, and even if it is here, we have a ceremony called uh, the breaking of the ice. So uh, it, uh, the, the Indian name is Pogo. So symbolically, um, when they break the ice, this that someone was watching the sun, and they said, it's time, you know, winter's over. That's what, that's what the name breaking of the ice means, that there's no more winter. And then, um, then the animals come out. So then the first dances that you'll see in this time are deer dance, buffalo, antelope are in there, rams, you know, all the, all the animals are coming back. So, uh, in the, and at this time, they're having little ones. So this is the oh, that's end right. Of, okay, yeah, that's right. And this would be the season of the yeah, end of winter, falling. beginning of of the spring. Yeah, full the the babies are coming. So you'll see little baby antelope running around during these um, dances, 
within the Pueblo villages. Um, so we have, uh, like you mentioned earlier, uh, holy people that watch the sunrises um, from different peaks. We have four sacred mountains, so the sun can come up um, uh, up or on that horizon towards the Sangre de Cristos, which is, uh, you know, pretty much on the Santa Fe ski right. base area, if you know where that is. The, um, the sun comes up and it casts shadows. And you spoke about sundials and shadows. Um, when we were in the Puye cliff dwellings as an ancestral home, our whole village was orientated to the sun. So in the summer, it rises. So the, the, the cave structures were designed so that it created a shadow and everybody stayed cool. So outside could be 100 degrees, but inside the shadow, it drops 10 to 20 degrees. So it's a lot cooler than being in the direct sun. And in the winter, you said the sun comes down a little bit lower. It stays exactly on the horizon and it gleams into the housing structures so that it warms us in the morning. So if you look at Pueblo orientation, it's based on the sun, sunrise. And when you speak about, uh, you talked about the sun, uh, different times of the sun in the day, there are phrases in the morning, uh, you know, Sengitamu, good morning, you know, and then at noon, you have a different uh, phrase that we talk to each other. We talk to each other according to, to the phases of the sun. So you're going morning, noon, and night. So and, I think, I think we know culture. Yeah, I think we know culture that sort of the notion of hours where we sort of dis divided a day into a specific mm -hmm. sort of sections. If you know, I think that if I understand correctly, it was first kind of done by Egyptians at some point, but, but hours weren't a period of time. It was a division of how long the sun was up in the sky. And so hours would be longer in the summer. It would take longer. And you still had 10 divisions in their day. Um, so, so this idea that, you know, there's, you're, do different things different times of the day based on that sort of arc of the sun across the sky. I think it's really fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. The old people never wore watches, but they watched the sun. So, you know, you there was a time to get up and do all your work. And then by noon, you eat, take a nap, and then go back to your work and then a time of rest. And it was all based on the sun, not how tired you were from <laughs> going down to the fields or hauling whatever you needed to do um you know and it and i think all pueblo villages uh lived by this orientation yeah and, and even plains people you know there was that always a time for a nap you and it's not wasn't a long nap it was like half an hour and boy everybody couldn't wait you know oh my god and then get up and take off again, you know, regenerate and go. Um, I, I, I keep pushing this thing and the audience probably knows me over a year or so as I sort of this, this connection to the natural world, right? So in, in my culture, in our culture, of course we have our celebrations, we have our things, we have our Thanksgivings and our Christmas and we, we start school at a certain time of year, we have our summer breaks, all those things happen. But we're not specifically observing some phenomenon specifically that's happening to the earth and in nature and tying it specifically to these ritual cycles. We just do it by the calendar. Somebody tells us, you know, okay, it's time for Christmas. So let's just go do that. Um, but one of the things that I, I think I understand about, you know, your cultures and people that I've met and elders that I've talked to is that that, that, that connection between what you're observing, what you're seeing, and then what you're doing is meaningful. Right. It's not just a happening on a calendar. It's something that happens associated with something happening in space and you're observing the whole thing. So that's what I kind of love about sort of some of the stories and the cultures. So, so. Yeah, there's a, a lot of stories um, about the sun and and different bugs and different animals and 
um, star stories is what you know you'll see a lot of time in obser observatories and these stories are based on uh, natural occurrences that happen here you know because right now we're getting ready to plant so we're watching we're not only watching the sun but we're watching the birds the insects um, right now the ants are still asleep so i know better than to start putting my seed you know getting it ready and i'm watching the birds and they haven't started to um, not where i'm at uh, up here in the in northern new mexico they really haven't started you know um flirting with each other you know doing no. bird bird things so <laughs> i i watch there's that uh, having babies thing again right? yeah you know i'm watching that because when that when that time comes then then i can start putting if they're going to start building then i need to start building and that the same thing with the ants and and those animals know the sun uh better than we do they they are a natural uh obs observer of the sun so i follow them a lot so i'm also watching deers you know it's it's a total environment awareness that we just don't we just don't need it on a day to day basis, right? I can get up and I can do my thing and I can get to work on time and I can do all that kind of stuff day to day to day. But but that sort of just mm -hmm. total awareness of what's happening around us is, is really is we lose that with populations and civilization exactly. and modern life and, yeah. and you know all of those things and that notion that the the solar cooling and the solar heating of those you know those places. Um, we don't do that because we have air conditioners and heaters and things like that. So, so <laughs> but now, people, I'm impressed with the green building because it's yeah, all based right. on that's passive right. solar. You know, it's that's all right. based on passive solar, which we've been doing for centuries. Yeah. You know, and they're just now getting on board. Mary, you had brought uh, uh, an image of a petro petro petroglyph. Yeah, I was just going to ask Comanche, Armand right? about that. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you show yeah. us what this is? Because this is part of your uh, your your half Comanche, and this is actually mm -hmm. from that uh, that culture, isn't it? Okay, this glyph is located in a place called Comanche Gap. It's in the Galisteo Basin. It's uh, about three miles south of or, or eight miles south of Santa Fe. Uh, if you look at this shield, this is a Comanche warrior. So this predates uh, Spanish contact. He's wearing moccasins. Uh, he's got uh, ties around his knees and you see his weapon up on the side up here. Uh, he's, uh, he's singing. And what he was, what he's been doing, the person who drew this actually sat in a rock cairn for four days and watch the sunrise. So he's sitting uh, exactly uh, facing uh, the, the sunrise and he's sitting in a little rock cairn and he's, he sits there for four days and uh, they give him a maximum of seven days. If he doesn't see his vision, then he gets out. But uh, if you look at the shield on the outer side, you see the rays of the sun. And then at the very edge, you'll see these feathers which are symbolic of, of sun rays. So he's asking, he's asking uh, this shield to protect him from a lot of uh, uh, arrows, spears, because at this point they're, they're actually um, getting his, so this is his vision quest. So this is done by Comanche men only and uh, so he's sort of like a puberty rite ceremony symbol. And the Comanche Gap cliff site is probably 86% Comanche glyphs. There's Hopi mm -hmm. sites in that location. And again, if, if you know how to get in here, I would suggest looking at these pictoglyphs and petroglyphs all over, even in Arizona. And yeah. look for yeah. these sun symbols. Look, uh, you know, they're public spaces and I want to say when COVID's over, visit the Pueblo villages and see which direction they're looking. They're actually looking to the sun. There. The, um, so I, I think I mentioned, Mary, that in polling, right, when we talk to our audience, we sort of like give them a chance to tell us kind of what things you like to hear about. There is always really high interest, especially in Native cultures and especially Southwestern Native cultures. And so, so you bring the pers perspective. So if, if I were an untrained, I'm an untrained person and I'm not an archaeologist in looking at this glyph, 
I'm going to bring something to it. I'm going to observe it. I'm going to sort of like look for detail. I'm going to do all that stuff. But having a background, right, and having, you know, seeing these symbols over and over again from the time you were a child to later life, this this sort of reads very differently than you than to you than it ever would to me. And uh, I know people are interested in this. And I guess the, 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 what you're inviting us to do is just, just get out and find them and talk to people and go visit the ceremonies. I guess COVID has shut things down a little bit, but, the, but it is possible, isn't it? It is possible. And um, if you look uh, at, there's a uh, the eight Northern Pueblos guide, or if you go to all Indian uh, uh, Pueblos over in Albuquerque, they give you a list of when these feast days occur. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome to go to the Pueblos. Um, a lot of the houses are open, so you can go in and have a good meal. Again, plants. Um, so during uh, the harvest, which is in August, you'll get corn, beans, squash, chili, you know, all these beautiful things. And in the other northern Pueblos, there's, there's a... Right now, they're getting ready in, in March. They play a game called shinny, and the women are the only ones who play it. The ball is made of a leather. Uh, it looks like the size of a mush ball. If you've ever played softball or baseball, mm -hmm. it's this big ball. And inside it is um, seeds. So whatever side of the village wins, it could be south side, north side, winter side, turquoise, pumpkin. You know, the, the, the battle for this ball. And whoever wins it, they take it to their fields and they break it open. And that says, okay, now it's time to plant and there's going to be a time of, of fertilization. We're going to have a good, good crop. And so um, all that's based on the sun. I've always thought if you want to know more about a culture and their rituals and all this stuff, follow their food, right? It's, exactly. Exactly. It's what, what yeah. they, and and the seasons we, again. So, yeah, so, exactly. So, so you have regular feasts. Do you, does food change during different times of the year or is it? Uh... It does because you're not going to get that fresh uh, straight out of the garden meal, you know, right. or like a calabacita. So in the winter, you're relying on a lot of dry goods, but you're going to get more uh, of, of a dry harvest, uh, whatever people preserve. My grandpa used to get um, unripened apples and cover them in newspaper and then put them in the back room. And then that was our treat because grandma would slice them up, dry them and make apple pie. Oh, they'd be super sweet after. Um, oh yeah. That, after, believe me, man. Or, or ferment, right? It's, it's exactly. Sort of... They were. And uh, then you get, um, then the, the wheat gets ground down. And then you get uh, the, the dry cornmeals, blue cornmeal, which is drank like coffee during the winter time, like a tole. Yeah. Um, uh, but we call it sakewe. So it's this time that we don't eat much meat. So we're kind of coming off that rich diet, the king's rich diet. Because, <laughs> because you know, uh, hunting season is slowing down. Um, a lot of... Uh, Plains people don't eat fish. Uh, birds were considered um, uh, unclean. So you're not seeing it. the turkey just, I mean, it's just that that's a holiday that was given to us by the outside. Yeah, world. Wasn't the, you weren't uh, running around eating turkeys. And... Oh, no, no. We were making turkey <laughs> feather blankets, but not eating them. <laughs> oh, actually, I saw a turkey feather blanket that you made, in fact, I think. Didn't I? Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. yeah I did. Yeah. So, uh, and so we're kind of starting to run out of time and yeah, I, said, yeah, I just I really I wanted to thank you for joining us and I you know like I say this was uh, is something we want to do I, let me ask you real quickly though in Diné um, there's a certain time of year that you can tell stories they they, they sort of reserve winter time when the frost like the ice is there uh, to do their star stories and storytelling you don't necessarily hear them uh, later I, mm -hmm. are, is it similar with your Pueblo is it uh, I think what, with the long winters, Grandpa told a lot of stories in the evening, and that's how I learned a lot of my stories about, you know, uh, the great beetle and um, how we got our fire and um, rabbit and coyote. So there's the coyote stories were still, you know, part of those long, 
and eating different bugs. So <laughs> <laughs> that Don't was you your lo- snack, you know. You and loved so- all of them, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, you. Uh, they were good. I mean, I don't have anything against bugs, but well, I've I've enjoyed over the last couple of months just meeting you and learning more about. about I was telling people today. I said every time I talk to you, I learn something new about the, the, your background, and uh, I really appreciate just your uh, your drive to preserve these ideas. Your uh, sort of you know drive to help us interpret. I guess that's really what we need is that sort of cross cultural. You know, here's here's an idea, here's how something works and what does that mean in your culture and how did it, how did you learn about it? And I, those, that just enriches all of our lives. That just makes everybody uh, sort of uh, get a better and bigger common understanding of things. So, so mm-hmm. you're just so nice to come on board. Hopefully, hopefully you'll um, do this again with us another day, right? I yeah. hope, I, I enjoyed this and uh, I hope the audience, I helped out a little bit of understanding how we view things from this beautiful sun that we have yeah. and look out look out and see the stars there, there's so much happening out there uh it's so beautiful alignments like i said you know i'll call my kids up and say look at that alignment something's coming be ready you know and i co- told rick i was like chicken little you know oh my god there's a planetary alignment something big is going to happen that's great of course, it was the Winter Olympics. Just- <laughs> <laughs> We've got that uh, competing with us too a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Mary, thank you so much, and I really, really appreciate thank it. You. I'm going to have thank to kind you. of well, we're going to kind of come to a wrap of our hour. All right. Gonna, Sounds uh, good. Turn, turn it back over. I think uh, Alex has something to show us about uh, uh, Aurora. In fact, here's a solar thing that we don't see much in the Southwest, but uh, Jackie and I actually had a chance to, to go up to uh, Canada one time. And sure enough, we saw an amazing light show, the Aurora. I just heard about a week ago that a big solar storm and sort of an Aurora red alert. And I thought, you know, maybe the audience would like to hear about this. Did you find a resource for us? Yeah, so we have a great resource. So I guess first, you know, the sun is obviously pretty bright in our sky, but it has other things that it can affect the Earth. And that's the Aurora Borealis. That's the Auroras. That's uh, the Aurora Borealis if it's in the Northern Hemisphere and the Aurora Australis in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, supercharged particles that are ejected from the sun interact with our atmosphere and cause light to pop up. And so this is a, the Aurora forecast. Um, this kind of gives you, this is a measurement of that kind of radiation that comes in and forms these auroras. And so, um, yeah, real time monitor of this magnetic and geomagnetic activity that causes the aurora. So right now it's pretty low, uh, 20% of a uh, probability of witnessing an aurora, but this is a great website to see just about what the weather's like, where you can see them, you know, just kind of different events that are happening on the sun. Here's some actual, like, uh, images taken from the sun of uh, solar flares and looks looks like so very exciting um so just a great aurora resource um we also have resources uh there's an asu news article about solar weather and solar storms um that we have um these links will all be in the chat um and then we also have of course the usual links of events like these and press and media that we have but make sure to check out the aurora watch and that article that we have on the ASU studies of solar weather, um, because those are both going to give you a little bit more to learn about the sun um, from what we've learned today already. So those are kind of the resources of our week, and I'll uh, pass it back to you, Rick. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. I always love that stuff. <clears throat> that was a great trip. I remember that very, very uh, well. Um, Alicia, you were going to uh, kind of share with us. Uh, I, oh, there's some some really strange news. I think we all sort of like, what? What's going on? To, so what'd you find? Let's share this week's current events. And unfortunately, I am coming to us with some some rather sad news, I have oh. to say. Uh, the International Space Station is retiring. So um, it launched in 1998. So going on 24 years of doing incredible science and research. On our left, we can see astronauts doing spacewalks. Uh, um, on the top, we see an aurora happening. Um, oh, there that is. Alex brought up, right? How serendipitous. Um, also, we have the first torch, uh, the first Olympic torch to be held in space uh, out here. Um, and then, of course, we have a couple of the 16 sunrises that astronauts on the ISS get to see every single morning. So, or every single day, excuse me. So, 
Um, like I said, the International Space Station has been doing incredible research for the last 24 years or almost 24 years. And it's sad to, uh, sad to say that the International Space Station will be retiring in 2030. Um, and so it will wrap up by 2031 and actually it won't be revolving or orbiting the earth anymore. It will actually crash into the Pacific Ocean in a specific place called Point Nemo, um, where actually 263 other spacecraft, or not necessarily spacecraft, but pieces of space debris have oh also crashed into this point. So it's called no Point Nemo. Yes, it's, it's a far off place. From, from any human, so we're able to safely crash some, some space debris there. But that's where our International Space Station will be, will be making its grand departure in 2030, 2031. So keep, keep looking So it's not right away. Spaces. It's not no, right away, but I did hear it in the news last week, so I'm glad you uh, gave us something like that. We actually have an astronaut in our faculty, uh, a, a, a Professor of Practice and uh, Katie Coleman was on the space station for a little while. So, so I wonder what she's going to do. Is she going to celebrate or is she going to mourn when it goes? Well, Thank you very that. much. Probably a little bit of both. To, yeah, yeah, I think so. I wanted to share a final thought with everybody because um, because we can. So there's a remember my five ways. And so I just I, this is something I've been sharing with people uh, in talks and things like that, especially about time and how we measure time and all that stuff. And you heard this theme pop up uh, in my conversation with Mary, but there are things that we can do to kind of reconnect with the sort of the real special meaning of time and, and how it works in space. And so you remember, uh, we went over this a little bit. Number one uh, was to sort of mark something annually, find a piece of the sky, understand it, name it. You can use your own, you can use a Greek alpha constellation, you can look, you can use a Native American constellation, they all have their own, they all have special stories, they all have a place, but they also reappear every single year in the same place at the same time absolutely regular. Once you get to know them, they start to come back and converse with you. It's really kind of fun to do. And then the next one is I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago. I said to sort of just kind of work to find things. You heard Mary talk about sort of like letting their, you know, calling her children saying, okay, here comes one, right? There's a conjunction. These things are not necessarily the ones that are sort of on this annual earth around the sun cycle, but things that happen on bigger cycles and uh, comets appear every month. So while aurora is unpredictable, you see them sometimes, you don't others, you have to go find them. Eclipses are coming up. We'll talk about this in May. There's a wonderful eclipse we'll sort of see. So, so make sure you understand what these phenomena are doing. So I'm going to leave you tonight with number three. And number three, it probably won't be a surprise to you, but I think what we do is need to change some of our habits seasonally. And what this means is that, you know, we grow up as humans and we've been humans for two million years and we sort of like came from the African savanna and we sort of, as we're developing as human beings, as, as our stealth structure is doing, as we, uh, our bodies are learning how to process food, we were doing things seasonally. You know, we were changing the way we eat, the patterns of how we find food, the things we do. And today we live in an environment where you don't have to. For goodness sakes, you can have an in and out burger every lunch for every day of the year. You're not supposed to do that. You are supposed to go sort of do things. And this is really what feasts are all about and for and celebrations and those things that sort of, as Mary was talking about, the breaking of the ice. These are things that you, you do purposely and you do in a cycle that's happening around you and that's important this is actually kind of easy for us these days because farmers markets are showing up all over the place you can actually go buy something on a saturday morning at the farmers market and it actually grew under the sun the uh, day before yesterday and you can eat that it's sort of your body wants that uh, that's sort of how this is supposed to work so Thing number three, right? You know, you're going to sort of like see, celebrate changing habits and uh, just kind of stick to it and make sure it sort of ties to the cycles of nature. Thank you very, very much for your attention tonight. Um, I, uh, in two weeks, we're going to continue our fundamentals and we're going to talk about planets and how we observe planets and how planets, as uh, the term that planets actually means wanderers, how planets wander around against the night sky. 
And we're going to sort of like do that. And then I promise we're also going to get back to the stars. This is a wonderful time of year to just sort of look at the stars. And uh, there's certain, uh, certain ones up that are really great. And so I want to just kind of like make sure that we have a chance to get back to that and, uh, um, and, and see where we go. So we'll see you in two weeks. I appreciate your thing. I want to give an extra special shout out for Mary Hockey and uh, thank her for joining us tonight and uh, the students and staff that uh, help us put this together. So thanks a lot. Thanks a ton. Okay, see you later.